Greetings fellow football managers and welcome to the FM24 February data update and patch and whatever else it is. It is 24.3 if I'm not wrong, which means everybody is going to start a new game. At least most of the people I know who play football manager always wait for this new update to start a new game. And if you don't know the significance of it, Football Manager and the team behind it, the researchers, they update the database, all of the latest transfers and things that happened in January, which you didn't get, obviously, because the game released in November. Excitingly, also, they tend to update a lot of the players and things like that. They tend to give players ability changes, stat changes, based on how they've performed during the season. So you're not going to get the 2022-2023 players anymore. They're going to be at least partway updated to reflect how the rest, the second half of 2023 has gone and this current season. So that tends to be pretty exciting. A lot of people wait for it to start another new save game. I do as well. What you see on the screen is my old save game though. If you've watched my last couple of videos, you'll know that I'm currently managing Valencia. I'm taking it nice and slow. I've been talking through initially how I built the squad, how I built the team, things like that. And then in my second video linked up here, I talked about what changes I've made to the tactics. As you can see, my league position is pretty good. I put out that last video around here. I think it was after the Sevilla game where I'd kind of turned around my form with all of these reds and the friendlies. I'd converted that to oranges and a couple of greens. I'd seen a lot of things that I liked. But I made another change around here. I went with the same thing for Real Madrid. Got a nil-nil because defensively the tactic was doing really well. Granada, I made a change because I wanted to see a little bit more attacking impetus from the tactic. In fact, I used one big change that one of you suggested in the comments of that last video. I changed my DLF to an attack, but I put dribble less on. That's exactly what the comment told me. Thank you very much for that. So I am actually reading all of your comments. I do try to reply to or at least pop a heart on almost every single one of them. And that was, I thought, a really good idea. I went for it. However, this video up here talks about balanced mentality. And in that, I said a few things. I followed my own advice and I switched my Mazala to support. Because otherwise, the gist of it is on balanced mentality, you do want a few players staying back a little bit to get on the ball. So the DLF support was doing that. For that reason, I had my Mazala on attack running beyond. Now that I switched the DLF to attack, I switched the Mazala down to support to make sure I have enough players in here to play my possession game because this CMA is gone. He's not involved in the possession game. This wing back tends to get on the ball and try and dribble their way up the flank. That's fine. That's what I want from them. That is my star player who can actually do that job that he wants to do. Fine by me. But I want all of these guys in here creating the numerical superiority and that is the big change that I made. The DLF to attack and dribble less so that he plays the ball rather than tries to dribble on his own. And the Mazala down to support. Along with the increased tactical cohesiveness, the fluidity, the team cohesion, all of that has been improving. And that's what's led to this stretch of results. The Mallorca game was after the change I made, but I saw a lot of things that I liked in the Mallorca game. I basically got FM'd if you ask me. Let's have a look at this game. You can see the uh, XG for Mallorca was only 1.02. I had 1.23. I had 63% of possession. I was happy with this. This should have been, in my view, a 1-0 win. Obviously, they had 1 XG. But if we go into the data, look at that. The XG that they had was basically through two big chances. They had two huge chances and they scored both of them. And I thought those were just individual errors from my team. So technically, I've erased all of that from my memory. And I've looked at this as being their performance during the game and essentially they created nothing. To be fair, a lot of things do change. Once they go 2-0, they would change things. They tighten up to hold the result and stuff like that, which may explain why they didn't create anything. But to be honest, in my view, that game was a 1-0 to me and I got FM'd. That is how I'm looking at it. However, the topic of this video is not about tactics. I'm not going to go into Valencia too much and talk about those tactics and things like that. What we are talking about is bottling it. I'm sorry for the thumbnail. I had to do it. But at the same time, I think it was actually worth doing because we've talked a little bit about the mentality and the psychology of the player before. But it's worth talking about the fact that you need to have an eye on your player's mental state if you want to get the best out of your games. As you can see, part of the thing with winning is that you are pushing up their mentality as well. Morale is superb. Everything else is satisfied. Even if a guy is unsatisfied or dissatisfied with one thing, for example, this guy, Diakabi, 
is not so satisfied with his situation at the club. He's very happy with almost everything else. He's extremely thrilled with his playtime as well. So that drives his morale up along with winning games. So aside from actually winning games and getting your players onto the field, what else can you do during the game? That loss against whoever it was, was it Mallorca? Yes, that loss against Mallorca was really cool because it gave me an opportunity to actually criticize the team. And a lot of players need a bit of criticism to then turn their form around or just improve. So we've improved from a bunch of draws. To be fair, there was a tactical change there. But me criticizing them after that loss actually kind of gave them a rocket and it turned the form around. As you can see, I've only conceded two goals and that was in a 4-2 win. I think I scored 3-0 or 4-0 or something like that before the other team got the two. So that as well is an interesting topic to talk about in a moment. But turning your players' morale around is a very interesting part of the game. As I said, I tend to do that within games. So let's just jump into a game here against Barcelona. I'm not going to change anything here. Team selection is going to be the same. Ooh, there's a few unfit players, but you know what? This is just a video and uh, I expect to lose against Barcelona anyway. Now, a lot of your players are going to have reactions here. We've talked about this before, so I'm not going to really get into it. But generally speaking, if you've designed your tactics around your team, you shouldn't have too many reds over here. So this is good. If we go into the match and we cross this warm-up stage and all of this stuff, go into the dressing room. Now, this is super interesting. You can see that Hugo Duro over here is motivated. Guillermo is motivated. Mamadashvili is motivated. Part of this comes from the press conferences that we have done before the game, the pre-match press conferences, the post-match from the previous game, things like that. I'm also not handling those. I'm leaving them to my assistant. There are a lot of things you can do with those though. And on one of my previous videos, the great Hadoken dropped a comment about how he used his pre-match press conferences to pull off an insane giant killing. You should check him out, by the way. He does some live streams. They're really cool. For me though, I don't need to pull out all the stops. My team is doing well, better than expectations and all that. Things are going according to plan. So for me, this is as much as I need for right now. I can see who my motivated players are and I can see who the nervous guys are. So when we talk about bottling it, these nervous state of mind guys are going to be your problem. You're hoping that none of your performers or your game-changing kind of players, for example, Sergi Kenos has been changing a lot of games for me off the bench. To be honest, playing out of position, which is why he's not starting, but he's been a really good bench option. He's won a couple of games for me. So I always keep an eye on his morale. Right now he's composed, so that is good. But there's a couple of other guys, Pablo Gozalbez, for example, he's changed a couple of games for me too. He's an interesting player, kind of an on-gange profile player. Look at that, almost no physicals, but very creative and he's got good long shots. So he can do something, but he is nervous. So that might be a problem. I'm not going to call these guys bottlers, but there is a potential that they could bottle this particular game. That is something to look out for. So the first thing to prevent people from bottling is this screen. Have an eye at this screen before you go into a game and then tailor your team talks accordingly. Down here, when it comes to your team talk, you want to look at your context. Body language stuff is something you can do as well. You can kind of reinforce the idea you're trying to give to your team talk with those. Not necessary. The main thing here is your statement. What statement do you choose? Remember to go with contextual statements. Something like, we've been on a good run lately, so go out there and impress me, would be okay. We're at home against Barcelona, to be fair. They're a great team, high reputation, and they're leading the league. So it is a bit dangerous to put too much pressure on my team. This is also not the greatest group of lads in terms of players who are good under pressure. So I'm not going to say something like, I expect nothing but a win from this match. That is too much pressure to put on their shoulders, in my opinion. If you know your team well, if you know them inside out, you check out their coach reports, you can figure out how good they are under pressure, which then allows you to choose an option like this. You can choose an option like this even if you're not sure about their pressure ratings if you're at home against a weaker team. So if I'm at home against, I don't know, Las Palmas or Granada or whoever it is, I'm not that familiar with the Spanish league even though I've been managing in it for a few days, you can then select an option like that, yes. If you're Valencia at home against Barcelona, I don't know if you should be risking that. You could, but try. Again, we have to win our home games. No excuses. Let's go. That's again, you're putting the pressure on them. So if you think that your team has good pressure ratings, you can try and throw that on. Go out there and give these fans their money's worth. That's a pretty good safe option. Ignore the recent praise in the media and just play a natural game. That's an interesting option as well. And this one down here, the media have given you a lot of credit lately. So go out there 
and put on a worthy display. This one for me is always recommended by the assistant, so I guess the game likes it. I think this option personally doesn't make too much sense. It's not something I would use as a manager. To be fair, I am not a professional manager, neither am I a professional motivator. So I could be missing something there. But to be honest, it, it's just never sat right with me and it's been there for a long, long time in football managers. So fair enough. For me, I would go with something like go out there and give these fans their money's worth. Even something like our home form is important to us. So let's go out there and make the advantage count. That's not putting too much pressure on them. It's still a good option. This is the room talk though. Remember that you can also go to defenders, midfielders, attackers, and individuals after you give the room talk. If this was away against Barcelona, I might say something like all the best out there tonight, have fun, or no pressure, or something like that. Take the pressure off them, especially when they're the underdogs in a big way. Let's go with this one. And as you can see, there's no real reaction to that. So that was a fairly neutral talk. I haven't really fired them up or anything. Maybe I should have gone with the assistant recommendation. You can now go for midfielders, attackers, individuals. So this is a good one if you have somebody in your starting 11, for example, who is nervous, or if you have a particular player you know is better than the others or responds better to pressure than the others. So that is about team talks. Again, at halftime, you're going to have an opportunity to kind of fire your team up or get them into the right mental state. We'll get there when we get there. But the next thing is we're going into the match and having a look at the shouts. All right, so just jumping in here because we've scored a goal. This is kind of my first opportunity to actually deliver a touchline shout. So the question is, do I? It's a tricky one because I've just gone 1-0 against Barcelona. We are at home, but it is Barcelona. So on the one hand, I would think about praising the team because they've done really well to score against Barcelona. The offset factor is we're not the smallest club. Yeah, granted, we had a really bad season last season, finished almost in the relegation zone, but... Valencia does have a decent reputation. It's a reputable club. It was expected to finish ninth or something this season. So they're not awful. And at home, they should be giving themselves a chance. Having said which, if you look at these stats up here, we are behind in this game and we've taken advantage of a counter-attack. So essentially, my plan is working. Yes, I can't dominate the ball against Barcelona, but look how high they're playing. I'm trying to lure them into the press right there, as you can see, and then try and nail them. Unfortunately, that's an offside and not an opportunity for a counter-attack. But you see my point. So that's why I'm not actually pulling the trigger right now on a shout. I would think about praising them, but I'm not going to do it because the conditions just aren't quite there. And as you can see at the bottom here, I hope my screen captures all of it, but a lot of the players are happy. If I look at that, pleased, confident. Gaia is pleased. Guillermo is pleased. And Javi Guerra is confident. The goal scorer is confident as well. So their mentality or their outlook, their state of mind has improved after that goal without me doing anything. So I don't really want to try and change anything there because I'm happy with that. Rule of thumb, if you want one, I usually praise if it's an even game or if I'm expected to win or something like that, as long as I'm not a severe underdog, like Barcelona away and if I scored a goal, I would praise them. But I would praise them on going 2-0 up or 3-1 or something like that. Getting a two-goal lead is kind of my trigger point for a praise. And after that, again, I'll praise at maybe the fourth goal or something like this. I generally praise when I think, okay, now we're in a really good position here. A one goal lead is nothing. So as long as your plan is actually working, there's no real need to prevent yourself from bottling it because you're not bottling it. You're doing well. You're, you know, executing your plan properly. So there's no real action you actually need to perform at this point. There are options such as encourage. That is okay. But as you can see, it says boost their morale. So this is a really good one to use when morale is down. If you have a lot of players across the team, essentially, who are in a bad state of mind, encourage is a good general one to give them to improve their state of mind. That can kind of help you really, really well. Fire up is an interesting one because it says passion, play for the shirt, which is good. That's a good one to do when you go down. The problem with it is, I think you should consider your style, the style of football that you're playing. I am playing in this particular match, in this particular tactic, a slow possession-based kind of tactic. So fire up for me 
is the wrong team talk. Or the wrong shout. Because what are they going to do with that passion? Try and play it fast? Get it into attacking areas? No. So that doesn't make any sense at all. So when I switch to attacking, then I hit fire up. And then the players can kind of run a bit harder, run faster, shoot the ball, whatever it is. They can actually execute that fire up well if they're told to play at a higher tempo, more aggressively, more attacking, something like that. But in a balanced possession-based game, fire up makes no sense to me. So I prefer encouraged in that sense. Demand more is another nice one. When you go down, work harder. You can kind of tell them, okay, make those tackles, win the ball, things like that. You can kind of see your players slow down a bit, especially if they get complacent. So that is a thing. But I'm thrilled with this and I don't need to actually step in. My players are absolutely not bottling it. They might do later on though, if there's a danger of me losing my lead, but I'll check in with you at the halftime team talk. I think this first half is one. So as you can see, we have jinxed it, or at least I have jinxed it. Our boy Rendell Correa got injured, Barcelona played on, and they went in and scored. So things have suddenly turned bad. Now we have to make an emergency substitution with Rendell Correa on the ground with a potential knee injury. What do we do? Again, now I'm looking at body language. One thing I'm looking at, yes, is match fitness or sharpness. So everybody has full energy and only some of them are match sharp. So those are going to be my first options for bringing them on. But at the same time, I don't want to bring the nervous guys on. Unfortunately, these guys, by being nervous, have signaled that they are not good substitutes for this particular game. If I absolutely have to, I will, and I will try and fix that nervousness with a team talk when I bring them on. I'll show you that in a second. But right now, I'm going to bring a guy with, number one, good match fitness, and number two, a good state of mind. Number three, he can actually play that position. So this team talk, when you make a substitution, I know I told you that I skip a lot of things, such as pre-match press conferences and things like that. I skip those all the time. This is something I do not skip. When I make a substitution, I always try and give the guy a team talk. Again, I kind of skip the body language a lot of the time, but I do like the right statement. For me, with this guy, he's an influential player. I think he's a pretty solid player in terms of his mentals. I'm going to put a bit of pressure on him. So if we go straight away to halftime after I make that change, again, I'm the dominant team. Look at that. But Barcelona created that chance based on Randall Correa's injury. Unfortunate, but it is what it is. Let's go. Dressing room. And now a team talk. Now, we have a problem. Fulkia looked nervous coming on. So I have probably given him the wrong team talk when I brought him on. So that is good to know looking at his body language here in the dressing room. That's a bit of a bonus because I wouldn't have seen it on the field immediately. So this is good. This is something I can fix up. Now, it's time for everyone to dig in and give everything you've got left tonight. We deserve to win this. So let's go and do it. That seems like a really good contextual one because I'm ahead on the day. They need to provide a good performance if we're going to win this. So I think this is the one I'm going to choose. The assistant recommendation, again, usually is on the ball, but I hate doing that, to be honest. I don't like listening to the assistant. That's just me. Let's give them this one and let's start. All right, we are back at 60 minutes. Unfortunately, I don't think you can see all of my screen, but it looks like our boy Fulkier, his mentality seems okay after that talking to that I've given him. He looks composed, just like everybody else. So that little individual team talk that we gave him has worked. We've kind of calmed him down, we've settled him down, and we've put him into a decent state to play the game rather than the nervous which he was when he came onto the field. And we caught that luckily in the halftime team talk. If he was still struggling a little bit, or at least as me and my staff could see, I would then go to touchline shouts over here and I'd give him something like an encourage I would also think about giving him a, let's say a demand more or a fire up or something, but maybe not for nervous. No pressure also tends to work for nervous, but there is a little bit of pressure and I did put the pressure on him when he was coming on. So to suddenly turn around and say no pressure now would probably then confuse him because I put the pressure on when I brought him on. So something like encourage would have been what I went to now if he wasn't already fixed. He is fixed though, so that's fine. The reason I'm stopping this at 60 minutes is 60 minutes is when I kind of pause the game and I think, okay, it's time to make some substitutions. There are many ways to actually make substitutions. Obviously, you probably don't want to bring out the guys who are confident, 
whose body language is good, motivated. Luckily, that's my keeper. I'm not going to change him anyway. And keepers, you normally don't have to substitute unless they get injured. And I love that in FM24, keeper injuries are a thing. So you kind of always have to have a guy on the bench, which is cool. Doesn't matter as much in Spain where you can have, what, 12 people on the bench, which is crazy. But in uh, leagues like, especially lower league, when you can have like five substitutions, that can be really interesting as a decision. Then again, your squad's pretty thin as well, so you might only have five substitutes. Point being again that I probably wouldn't bring off the guys who are having a good game unless their fatigue was way down. So my first thing is I'm looking to substitute off the guys with bad body language and bad fatigue, and then I'll weigh it up here and there. If I have a decision where, okay, I keep a tired guy on, but his body language is good, okay, fine. Or do I keep a guy on whose body language is bad, but he has plenty of gas in the tank? Those are interesting decisions that you do have to make. I personally, in this FM and in the last few FMs, they have focused a lot on fatigue and condition and things like that. And the lower a player's condition goes, the worse they are going to perform or they're not going to be able to give all of what they have because they just don't have any gas in the tank. This FM, or I think the last couple of FMs, in fact, have also gone away from that perfect percentage reading that they used to have. They used to be able to tell us, okay, this guy is, you know, 95% match sharp and 90% match fit. So you can make a really informed decision. I like this new system of giving kind of a, just an indicator of match fitness here. You have the thumbs up, then you have the arrow down and the arrow up and the arrow steady and the thumbs down and things like that as well as a basic heart meter, which uh, kind of cycles through green, then it goes down to kind of a yellow, then it goes to orange, and then it goes to red below that. So for me, normally these orange guys are going to be the candidates for a substitution off. Center backs, normally I will not take off because they're not moving as much as the others. They can handle when their condition is low. That said, if they go down into the red, into the quote-unquote red zone, I might be thinking about taking them off. In this team, with this tactic, I don't have that many centre-back options. Also, the guy I'm trying to blood, this guy, Gazirovsky, I have no idea how to pronounce his name. He's kind of my backup libero. That's kind of the role I have identified for him. But he is nervous. He's not in a good state of mind. So I'm not going to bring him on. I'm not going to think about moving Diakabi to take over from, uh, let's say, Cenk, for example, and then bring Gazirovsky in there. No, he'd also have to mark Lewandowski. So no, bad idea. I'm not going to change my defense, but I'm kind of looking at Javi Guerra. Even though he's having a good game, he is kind of getting into the red zone. Guillermo is my number one candidate to make a substitution because he is really kind of getting close to that red zone. He's also in a position where he has to move a lot. Normally, a DM on defend, you can kind of get away with because they're a little bit more static. An anchor man would be super static and you can get away with that. But a DM on support, he's getting all the way up from the edge of the box down to the edge of the other box. He's almost a box-to-box -box midfielder in this particular tactic. So he is my number one candidate. I am, however, a bit hamstrung by the fact that Gozalbez is nervous. So I'm very nervous about him bottling it if he comes on. So I don't really want to bring him on. My other candidates really are Kanos and potentially Farofa, but his match fitness is low. So as you can see, my options are super duper limited. However, I need to jump in there and make a decision. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring Pepe Lu back there. Pepe Lu is awesome. Brilliant, brilliant player. And he can play all kinds of different positions and things like that. I'm going to bring him back. I'm going to bring Guerra into this Carrilero position so that he doesn't have to move as much anymore. Normally, I bring Gonzalez into this Carrilero position because, again, he's not capable of moving. But I feel like Guerra, with his low condition now, is a bit closer to those particular physical stats. So I'm kind of okay with this. Plus, there's the body language benefit, and Guerra is having a good game. So hopefully, he keeps on having a good game, even though his condition is low there. Now I need to bring off Guillermont. I don't want to take off Almeida as well because his condition is okay, and he's having a good game. So Almeida has to stay on. I could think about changing his role. That is something. But in the end, I am not going to. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring on Kenos and I'm going to put him here into the middle CM attack. This is going to be fun. I'm training him as a Mezala, basically. I like his stats. I'm also, I also had a small phase where I was training him as a wingback. But again, I have to say thank you for a couple of comments. They said I should try Fran Perez as a wingback. His tackling is pretty low. I think the comment said that his tackling was decent or with good tackling, he could be good at wingback. And that's true. If he had decent tackling, he would be good at wingback. But I've said, okay, let's try and train him up there. It'll take a while, but that is what it is. Kanos then I've shifted into training as a Mezala. But in this case, I will put him at center midfield attack. That said, 
I'm looking at Hugo Duro as well. His condition is getting really low. He's not playing that well. 6.6 .6 rating means he's not really doing a job. And I think somebody like Yaramchuk could actually do a job there. He has jumping, which Duro doesn't have. He's a threat in the air. And he also has decent composure. So he's a pretty good finisher. So I'm going to bring on Yaramchuk as well. Let's give these guys a little team talk. Uh, I want you to go out there and make an impact. That's generally a good one. Yaramchuk looks pretty happy. Kanos looks composed. I'm fairly confident that they're not going to bottle it, but we don't know that for sure. We'll have to wait until the substitution goes through and then look at them again on this main match screen as they're on. Okay, they're on now. Yaramchuk looks okay. Seemed calm coming onto the pitch. That is absolutely brilliant. And Kanos looks motivated and wants to make a difference. This is a really interesting one. If I'm not wrong... Kanos was at Barcelona and just came to Valencia, or he went from Valencia to Barcelona and came back, or something like that. I'm completely talking out of my butt, probably. I think there's a story like that, which is why he's so motivated and wants to make a difference. I'm pretty sure he was at Barcelona last season and didn't do well for them, or didn't get games, or something like that. So that could be why his body language is good. Point is, with that kind of body language, he is not going to bottle it. All right, we're about 73 minutes into this game and things are really on a knife edge. It could be either team I'm countering quite well. Barcelona are kind of dominating possession. It is really tricky. This game could honestly go either way and my fatigue is really starting to tell. As you can see, a lot of these players are getting close to that red zone. They're in deep orange and my substitutes, as you saw, are not very good. Problem here is Roman Yaramchuk is struggling to meet the pace of the match. This is something that you'll see from a lot of substitutes and there's a few ways to deal with it. One of my ways is to give them an individual touchline shout of fire up. I know I said a little while ago that it doesn't really make too much sense to give a fire up when you're playing a slower kind of system and you're, maybe you're not pressing very much. For me, fire up tends to be in high pressing, higher pace systems, attacking systems, but one situation that I've seen fire up work is when a player is actually struggling to meet the pace of a match. Fire up can help in these kinds of situations. Another one that can help is the general encourage. And for me, I think demand more also can work. So which one I do, it's kind of a lottery. I don't know. Again, I don't know the perfect answers to these, but these are generally the three options that you do have. And you can make a decision based on the context. I'm just going to go with demand more as an individual shout and see how that works. Let's just keep an eye on Yaramchuk and see if he can improve a little bit based on that shout. This game is really, really tricky though. As you can see, keeping Gera on was a good shout. He is uh, doing pretty well. But let's see what happens. So far, no change on Yaramchuk as we go into a highlight as well. There hasn't been anything changing up. So it looks like our shout was unfortunately ineffective. Maybe fire up would have been a good one. There, he's on the ball as well, getting a header away. I can just think that maybe a better shot would have worked. No, actually, it has worked. The feedback just kicked in. He is fired up by the feedback. He is green. There we go. We have fixed that particular little problem. Obviously, that doesn't make a huge difference. I don't think that's going to absolutely change the game. But having one of your players in a good state of mind can really, really help. And make sure that they're not, you know, doing something silly, sitting back, going second to the ball, something like that. Yarmchuk should now perform to the best of his abilities. He's also fresh, so he could become a game changer in this game. Let's see. Kenos. Oh boy. Remember, we pointed out that he was fired up as well or in a good state of mind for this game because of his relationship with Barcelona. So no surprise that he's turning up. So we are deep into this game now, big chance for Barcelona, and I feel like at this point, I need to make a tactical change. So I'm just going to pause the game right there, and I'm going to get into my tactics. Right there, I saw that Pepe Lu was kind of out of position on that particular occasion. I'm seeing again that Fulkia is nervous. Oh boy, this is not good. I thought we'd fix that problem, but it looks like we haven't quite managed to do that. But the problem is, I saw a big old hole in the middle of my defensive area, in my DM zone. So I'm thinking about just shifting this to a DMD. Obviously, that's not what my tactics are supposed to do. I generally want him to kind of get up into those attacking areas and help keep the ball high up in the opponent's third. But this feels like a game that if I'm going to sneak it, I might be able to do it using a counterattack. So I'm going to shift Pepe Lu into a DMD. Can he do the job? 
he's decent. His marking is 11, tackling 13, positioning 16. So he shouldn't fail at the job. He's not going to be the best DMD ever, but he should be able to do a job. Honestly, I'm kind of thinking of Salim Amala as well. His stats and stuff are okay. He can tackle. He can do a bit of a box-to-box -box job. Problem is, he's also nervous. So that is, again, getting into my head a little bit. I don't really have that many good options. Farofa feels like a decent option, but his match fitness or match sharpness is way, way down there. So let's risk it. Let's go with Amala. And let's take off either Almeida or Javiguera. Which one should we do? Almeida is playing better, but Javiguera is into the red zone. So let's do that. Amala on, Javiguera off. Give him a team talk, and then let's go with no pressure. Since he is nervous, let's see if we can fix it with no pressure. There we go. Felt the pressure lifted. So those kinds of things can help your guys kind of settle into the game, put them in the right frame of mind, and play properly. I don't think I'm going to win this even so because Barcelona is so strong. Guys like Lewandowski can score a goal anytime. But I'm giving myself as many chances as I can is, you know, my feeling on this game. And that is it. It is full time. It's finished 1-1. But if we look at this screen here, I am genuinely enjoying this. Looking again at the match stats, we've got more XG than Barcelona. We've taken more shots. We've both had three shots on target. Corner kicks was more Barcelona. They've done a lot of fouls. They got a couple of yellow cards. They injured one of my players as well. And in the end, they picked up an injury at the end there. Possession was 48 to 52 in the end. 92% pass completion for my guys. So I'm pretty happy with that. Possession, dominating it against Barcelona, even at home, is tricky. But we've generated better chances. And if we look at this match story as well, we are way above Barcelona most of this game. And they created this big chance here because our boy Randall Correa was on the ground at that point, and then he went down again later, which is when I loaded up the substitution, and I showed you that a little bit earlier. Point being there, again, we've been above Barcelona. I know it's at the Mestalla, therefore we should have a slight home advantage, but again, it is Barcelona, and we're playing Valencia, so I'm totally happy with this result, totally happy with the 1-1 draw, with all of the changes that I made, and I feel like I was able to show you a few things about how to use shouts and team talks and substitution talks and stuff like that, to try and keep the player's morale right and ensure that they don't bottle it. One other thing that we didn't touch on, again, we didn't really have the opportunity, is complacency. And when you go 2-0 up, 3-0 up, you are still kind of within that slight danger zone and another team can actually pull it back because they're just going to start attacking and hitting you. And if your tactic isn't quite right, if your players get too complacent, that could be a big problem. The focus shout can help you with that. If they get a couple of good chances in, or your players just are second to the ball a lot. If you see that in the match, if you actually concede a goal, you're 3-0 up, you concede a goal, it goes to 3-1, that's a bit of a danger sign. You can shout focus or something like that and tell your team to switch back on. That's something you can do. Going into the dressing room now, this is really important. Obviously, the morale situation is pretty good among the players who played. They're quite happy with the result. A lot of them are confident, self-assured, blah, blah, blah. Good. We dominated the game, so I could go with something like you were unlucky tonight. Or something like, we didn't get the result that we wanted, but you should be happy, we created the chances, and that kind of thing. Be very, very careful about being super demanding here with these two, for example. Those are the demanding ones. You can do that if you were 1-1 at home against a weaker team, but 1-1 at home against Barcelona, I would go with something like you were unlucky. Remember to try and stay contextual, because if you start giving the wrong talks, if you start building the wrong message, you can then create a bad mental state among your players across the season. If you praise them too highly for, you know, 1-0 wins, for example, if you're Manchester United and you praise them for a 1-0 win against Fulham, as unrealistic as that is, uh, if you say, oh God, you guys are the best, you guys had a fantastic game, so on and so forth, and they just won 1-0, they scraped it at home at Old Trafford or something, then uh, you need to be very, very careful about being effusive in your praise. Your players will love it, all of them will go to dark green, uh, as you can see, no dark greens on this sheet, but that is fine. Sometimes these reds or oranges are good. Your players can be pissed off. Don't be afraid to get your players a little bit angry, a little bit worked up at you. As long as they're not kind of retreating into their shell, they're not going on the nervous side. Nervous is bad, but something like worked up could be good because then you can see that they expect more. They're more ambitious. They want to win by more than 1-0 at Old Trafford against Fulham. They want to actually dominate that game rather than sneak that game. That is a good thing. 
So you want to generate that kind of thing. One other thing I need to talk about and tying this back to the new data update that dropped yesterday. Again, I know a lot of you will be starting new saves and thinking, okay, this is going to be my last big FM24 save. Remember with your manager to give yourself good motivation. That's the stat that helps you make the most of things like shouts, team talks and all of that. You need a high motivation skill. Sometimes with low motivation skill, you've got motivation of two or three or something. You might give the right team talk, the right context. You might have the right plan. But because your manager's motivation stat is so low, it might actually fail. So just look out for that. And it's so fun to play around with the player's mindset. I know that sounds awful. Again, I need to apologize slightly. Again, we're going to move on. Send the assistant for all of this crap. We don't need that. Again, I need to apologize slightly for using old Ben Chilwell as the thumbnail of this. But uh, it's so fun to watch him. Those of you who didn't watch the League Cup final uh, last weekend, Ben Chilwell was giving the Liverpool under-21s a lot of grief. He was trying to bully the 18, 19, 20-year-old boys, which is quite funny. I don't know if any of you guys, I'm sure probably a lot of you have played team sports in your time, but if a player is being nasty to the youth products of the opposition team, you can really, uh, for example, get yourself a bad nickname. I had one guy in my cricket team who did something. I don't even think he did something too bad, but the opposition had a youth player. And uh, he maybe gave him a bit of chat or something. And he earned himself a nickname that never went away. It genuinely never went away uh, through the rest of his playing time. I was at that club for years and years and that nickname stuck. It genuinely stuck. It was great. So um, I wonder if anybody knows any Chelsea players or the Chelsea backroom or anything like that. I wonder if Ben Chilwell has a new nickname. Just a fun thought. Thank you for watching. Talk to you in the comments below. Cheers.